Welcome to our second webinar in the series um, for sustainability in personal care. We're very happy to have you with us this morning. Um, and if you have any questions or um, comments to make, please just pop them in the meeting chat on the right hand side of the screen. Right, let's begin. Just a quick introduction for this morning. Our presenters are myself. I'm Lisa Tassie de Clack. I am the Business Development Manager at Cerebel. We will also be hearing from my colleague Liesl Kilder, who is our Technical Manager, and Tembisile Mashanini, who is my counterpart, also Business Development Manager. Just a couple of house rules. Um, we please all the participants are on mute. If you have any questions, uh, we would we put them in the Q and A box on the right of the screen, and we will host a Q and A session at the end of the presentation and happily answer any questions you may have. A link to the product brochures will be shared with all participants. There is also a link available on our media center on our website where you can access our brochures, our webinars, and videos. Right, so just to kick off, uh, those of you that don't know about Cerebel, um, we are a company based in Johannesburg in South Africa, founded in 2001. Our core business was uh, wax-based raw materials for the personal care industry. This is obviously our speciality, and we have a lot of experience in blending different types of waxes. Um, we also are highly in innovation driven. We have um, a lab on site that we do a lot of development work for. Many of you will know that we do a lot of prototype development for customers. Mm -hmm. And at the core of our beliefs is the belief that industry can be leveraged mm -hmm. to positively impact society. Obviously, this is uh, led to this webinar uh, because of these um, value systems in order to drive sustainability in different kinds of areas. As an organization, we seek to catalyze social transformation, economic upliftment, and sustainable development. Just a quick overview of our products and services. We have four categories within our portfolio, one being waxes, both synthetic, safe synthetics, and natural waxes. We have exfoliants. These are obviously produced from our wax raw materials. We also have our speciality range called the soft spheres, and we have our African botanicals. Cerebel is also very proud of the certifications that our company has achieved over the years. We are ISO certified, China Inky compliant, proudly South African. One of the most recent certificates that we have just received, received is the EFCI GMP certificate. This is uh, really an achievement for our company, making us one of only 72 companies globally to adhere to GMP for cosmetics. So this is obviously, um, Cerebel tends to pride itself on being able to meet the regulatory requirements required across the globe. We also have Halal. Most of our products are vegan, biodegradable, GMO-free. Some of them are Cosmos approved. We're marine friendly and preservative free. In terms of our global approvals, we supply customers worldwide. Uh, we work with many distribution partners. You'll recognize the logos um, of some of the partners that we work with globally. And uh, we have a really great distribution network for the distribution of our, of our products in order to service our customers. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Tim Bestile, who is going to start with the presentation, looking at the trends overviews for sustainability. Right. Good morning to everybody. Um, I will be looking over at the trends overview in personal care. And in the end of this, related back to how Cerebel answers to these trends. On the left, we highlight the global trends that have been highlighted throughout um, a couple of years, but also more strongly within 2020. 
That being clean beauty, sustainable sourcing, circular economy and upcycling, that has been quite a buzzword that has um, gained quite a lot of prominence in 2020. Skin repair and moisturization <clears throat> have become quite a focal point, um, especially with hygiene and gel, alcohol gel formulations um, due to the pandemic. And of course, transparency was even more highlighted where safety of ingredients is quite important. On the right, we are going to look at functional trends that are informed from the global trends, one being hygiene, of course, due to the state of where we are, but more importantly, with lockdowns happening around the world and now recently um, within Europe as well, having a second round of lockdowns, it's been quite important for nourishment and self-care um, ingredients and products to be available as people are looking for more spa experiences at home. Hydration and moisturization are extremely important. Again, with the focus being on hygiene and having your alcohol sanitization, there's more focus now in ensuring that skin is better hydrated and moisturized. Safe ingredients due to the pandemic, again, highlighting the need for safe ingredients. And now a new trend being mask me, which is basically the acne that has become prominent in the wearing of masks. Now, here we have um, some clips from a report that was done by Mintel uh, through a 2019 survey. This is actually a clip that we also referenced in the previous webinar that basically speaks about clean beauty and really what it is, where there's still a lot of confusion on what this trend really means. Um, and on the 2019 survey that was done, uh, that can be found on statista.com, 58% of respondents considered clean beauty products that are natural, 32 perceived it to be, you know, um, ingredients or products that had low harsh chemicals. 28% said clean beauty had to do with cruelty free. Um, such a varied response show that there's still um, a lot to be um, added in terms of the definition of what this is. Um, in terms of the Global Beauty and Personal Care Trends Report 2030, um, again, what is being highlighted is that even with the confusion of clean beauty, the most important thing is transparency. Um, and so on the right there, there's a clip that says in 2030, the clean beauty industry um, will be focused on transparency of the ingredients that are used in products. Here again, just highlighting on clean beauty, a article that was published this year by Cosmetics and Toiletries, focusing and helping formulators look at what clean beauty or formulating clean beauty really means. Um, and here they suggest returning to the basics. Well, with sustainable sourcing becoming quite a big trend and a big focus for all the big brands and anyone in the personal care space, um, here we have a CNT peer reviewed article that shows what embracing sustainability is. And here we have a clip that actually shows Vici's um, approach to sustainability, a case study that was done, and their full primal focus being ingredient sourcing, um, where they focused on ensuring green chemistry from the roles that they use. Um, they focused on packaging to ensure 10% of um, the glasses that they used is recycled and 44% reduction on their caps. Formulate, uh, the formula biodegradability also became a focal point, uh, shifting from 71% to 91% of the formulation being biodegradable. And of course, social as well, where they actually supported initiatives um, uh, centered around Burkina Faso, where it was on shea butter and ensuring that the shea butter that was used came from a sustainable program. And these are just an example of how big brands are looking at sustainability. The next clip that we have is also from an article that basically looked at the five key sustainability beauty trends. Um, and what they highlighted was the five things uh, that brands are really looking at. One being the circle of life, um, trash to treasure, which follows the circular economy, 
trend, zero waste brands, proof of profitability and sustainability marketing. And within this article, if you actually go into it's a listed, there's a list of companies that are focused on these sustainability trends. And you can basically read up on um, what their approach is for the individual brands that they manufacture. Now with sustainability, the key um, thing to look at is what is the consumer thinking about that. So within the same article by Cosmetics Business, it was quite interesting that many of the European um, countries, the consumers, over 50% of the consumers um, would avoid products that they deemed to be harmful to the environment. Um, and of course, this is a growing trend internationally. US is sitting at about 42.5% and about Brazil, over 60% of the consumers avoid products that are harmful to the environment. This is an upward trend internationally as people are looking for products that are safe for the environment, but also safe for themselves. Now, in terms again of um, sustainable sourcing, the word transparency is highlighted again. Here we have um, some clips where seven, it shows that 70% of shoppers consider the environmental impact before they even buy the product. 73% of consumers say transparency is extremely important to them. So what are the ingredients that you actually putting into your um, formulation needs to have some traceable information, um, ensuring that they know exactly where these ingredients are coming from. Um, and of course, this was a report that was done by the Personal Care um, Council. Talking about transparency and where Cerebral falls into and how this transparency in clean beauty is really a strong trend that um, really everybody is highlighting. Um, as Cerebral, we are part of or partnered with Novi Connect, um, which is a US based procurement platform that tries to introduce transparency into the personal care and the uh, cosmetic markets. And this is basically Cerebral's stamp on ensuring that whatever ingredients that we do offer our formulators and our brands, um, there's transparency in terms of where the ingredients come from and the production process as well. Here we look at the functional trends that are informed from the sustainability, transparency, and um, what we've just highlighted before. And we took quite a various one, um, one from cosmetics industry that's basically saying, you know, when it comes to hygiene and using hand sanitizers, it's becoming really the new normal where two thirds of parents are saying, you know, using a hand gel is now the new normal, even for children. Again, um, the functional trends that speak to the mask new trend where um, a lot of consumers are now looking for products that um, help nourish and help to soothe the skin. And again, a lot um, of manufacturing, but also a lot of marketing going towards self-care beauty items. Um, that is becoming quite a big trend where consumers are looking for simple or unique formulations that can introduce self-care at home. Um, and of course, this informs the spa at home trend as well. In terms of just touching back on sustainability, um, and as much as we are talking about global trends, we need to actually highlight um, what has been raised by the UN for the sustainability goals for 2030. Um, Cerebral is quite aware of this as well. And what we aim to show within this presentation is how African botanicals can actually speak to the sustainability goals um, that are placed in front here where 1 to 17 sustainability goals that speak not just only to the environment, but to social upliftment, socioeconomic programs. And this is what we'll also be touching on as we look at the individual ingredients. Um, basically showing how as Cerebral we are aligning to the sustainability goals of 2030. Okay, and of course, 
with global trends, functional trends, and all the trends that we basically touched on and what people are really talking about, we are presenting African botanicals as the solution to many of these global and functional trends and how by using these ingredients, you are using ingredients that are actually towards the sustainability goals for the planet. Okay, and I am now going to hand over to my colleague, Hazel Kilda. Okay, good morning. Um, so before we get into exactly all the oils and what the, the application is in personal care, um, I think it's important to understand where do they come from and what plants are used. I think it's all part of the transparency and where, where ingredients come from. So we're going to look at the, the first one, uh, which is the, the baobab tree, where we get the baobab oil from. Um, the baobab tree is sometimes called the upside down tree because of the way that the, the branches, um, the branch system, it almost looked like a root system. And this is mainly found in the South African Botswana Namibia, Mozambique, and other tropical African countries. It can grow up to 25 meters in height. And what is important to notice about this tree is that, that you have to think of the future because it takes about one, eight to 23 years before it bears the fruit that you want to use for the oil. And in certain South African species, they've actually said it takes the tree 150 years before it um, actually produces the fruit. So some traditional uses of this tree outside of personal care is that the leaves are very rich in vitamin C, as is the oil. Um, it's got sugars, potassium, calcium, and they cook these leaves to use as a fresh vegetable or dry them or crush them for later use. The fruit pulp is also used in drinks and food. The seed powder can be used as a refreshing drink in vitamin C. Um, the seeds are used in food or, as we know, to make oil. And the inner bark is used for rope making. The roots can be used for dye. And just to note that baobab oil um, can be harmful for when you digest it, so therefore it's only for topical application. The next one we're going to look at is the bulbine frutescence. So this is the a plant extract that we sell, and it is in the um, South African region found and in Lesotho and Swaziland. It's the one that we say is very similar to aloe vera. So if you look at the plant, the picture of the plant, it is a branch succulent. And what is very interesting about this plant is that you, you take the plant out of the ground, you go take the gel out of the leaves, and then you actually replant the plant and it just grows further. So it's very sustainable sp specifically from a growth point of view. Um, as we said, it's very similar to aloe vera. So all the traditional uses outside of personal care is you can apply it to burns and rashes and insect bites. Um, it's also used more medicinal for acne and cracked lips if you've got cold sores or ulcers. And what people also say is when you take the fresh leaves and you boil it in a cup of water, um, it can help for coughs and colds and arthritis. The next one is the, oh, the Kalahari melon tree or the Kalahari desert melon. It's not a tree, I apologize. <laughs> it is a very big watermelon, as you can see. Um, this is also a very interesting plant found mostly in South Africa and in the desert environment. So it is highly adaptive to surviving drought and harsh desert environments. Um, when you look at the traditional uses, it can be a water source sp specifically when it's very dry. And they also use these fresh fruits as a stock feed when they don't have enough um, feed for the, for the animals. You can roast the seeds and you can make it into a meal since it's very nutritious. Um, they use the leaves and the young fruit as green vegetables. And then when you look more at the medicinal side, they say that it can be, be used for worms or for alcohol poisoning or for diabetes. So quite a, quite a useful plant. Then the next plant we're going to look at is the marula tree. Um, I think this is the, the most famous one maybe coming out of Africa, and it is native to southern and western regions of Africa. Um, can grow up to 18 meters high and it usually bears fruit from January to March. Again, the fruit is very, very well used and um, utilized specifically outside um, personal care. Um, it's edible. It's got very high vitamin C content. They actually say that one marula fruit contains the equivalent of th vitamin C of three oranges. So very high in vitamin C. Um, you can make the fruit skin. You can make a drink of the wood is quite soft, so they use it for carving. Again, the bark can be used to make rope or to make a light brown dye. 
Um, you can also use the bark for, for medicinal uses, um, for treating diarrhea, and they say that the green leaves are eaten eat to relieve heartburn. The last plant that we will be looking at is the Moringa tree. Um, so this is native to India, Pakistan and Nepal, um, but it has been um, naturalized in South Africa, so or Africa, so that means that it's been grown here for more than 500 years. Um, it's a very fast growing tree. It can grow up to three meters within the first year of planting, and it can go then grow as tall as 15 meters. And the trees produce the parts that you use for the oil within the first six to 12 months. So it's a very sustainable plant since it grows so fast. Um, again, looking at the traditional uses outside of personal care, um, you can basically eat the whole tree or utilize the whole tree except the roots, um, and it's very nutritious. Um, the leaves contain more vitamin C than oranges, so almost the same as the marula. Um, it also has got potassium, more than that is in bananas, and it's also got more protein than eggs and milk. And therefore, you will find that a lot of the tree is actually used for medicinal and nutritional benefit outside of personal care. Okay, so next, after um, we've gone now talk a little bit more about what Cerebal's offering is, um, Lisa will continue to define sustainability according to what we call the four pillars. Thanks, Liesl. Um, I think it's also very interesting always to have a look at these uh, species of, of fauna um, and to understand, you know, we, we always focus on the personal care applications and it's always quite interesting to see the applications outside of our industry. I think um, what we've done as a, as a company is to define sustainability in according to our references. So we've basically developed a four pillar structure that we'll run through now. For us, defining the sustainability um, looks at the four areas that we've highlighted below. We have your human pillar, environmental, social, and economic. Um, and what has been very important to us and what we've had a, a big drive towards doing is creating a culture of social enterprise farming from which to, to, do, to draw our products from. So just having a look a little closer at the pillar of um, human. So we've also linked this back to the global sustainability goals of, of 2030 that uh, Tembi went through. Um, we look at this very deeply. It's quite close to our, our hearts, the equity to employment. So this means not just not just extracting people from other jobs. It means actually creating jobs for the people that are unemployed. So especially in the rural communities where uh, people need work in, in these kind of regions where there isn't work readily available, the farms and, and those sort of regions where we source the products from for the oils are constantly creating jobs. So the more we can grow these markets, the more jobs are created um, in the producers' farms. We also look highly at skills development. Um, this is, our, you know, our staff is involved in the agro and production processes. We do a lot of employee internal training to upskill and develop people. Uh, there's also growth through internal job promotion. So currently we have had three managers and 28 supervisors graduate from internal career development. Uh, we have state of the art uh, on site QC lab and Euro certified production facilities to ensure global level technical skills are developed internally. And we often do skills development workshops just to equip our employees with the skills to, to perhaps even start their own ventures um, and also to just add to that innovative and entrepreneurial spirit that is very South African. These, these topics kind of also link to number one, eight and nine on the right hand side of the screen where we're speaking to things where we are alleviating poverty, um, in, in, impacting economic growth, and also our buzzword and our favorite uh, pastime innovation and uh, infrastructure. Looking at the second pillar that we've identified, uh, environmental, um, being aware of points number 12, 13 and 15 on the right hand side. This is obviously we're looking at climate action, uh, life on land and responsible consu consumption and production. 
So the objective here is to just basically leave our environment in a better state than when we found it, especially for future generations. We were looking at zero harm and carbon footprint friendly farming. Um, and a lot of these we're busy with the analysis of the carbon footprints uh, and we should have some data on that moving forward sh shortly. This is an ongoing process, as we know, as we sort of develop our range and we sort of expand our, our, our products. This is something that we're going to be doing more and more work on. Our certification, our products are organic um, and globally GAP. And the plants that we cultivate are obviously, as Liesl has described, with things like the watermelon and the bulb bean, um, they're very water wise and drought tolerant plants. This also speaks to uh, the global trend of uh, water free products. Um, we do wild harvesting. So over 200 baobab and moringa trees are planted currently um, and are, as Liesl said, um, from 150 years old, that's when they can start bearing fruit. So future generations are definitely going to reap the benefit if we look after these plants and these farms um, currently. We have a zero pesticide uh, policy and pests are controlled naturally. And obviously we have ethical farming choices so we have natural organic cultivation of the baobab, marula, moringa trees, and these are also naturally prolifer prol proliferated um, within the plantation. So just looking at the third pillar, this is the social pillar, also speaking to relieving poverty, improving the quality of the education in the rural areas, and creating more sustainable communities. Um, we look at being involved in upliftment, upliftment and empowerment through social products, projects, sorry. Um, specifically, there are some projects that we can reference if you are looking for more information um, on these projects, you know, we're happy to share the, the actual uh, photographs or the, the work that we're doing. So the Molakala Kwena Craft Art Development Foundation this is our focus to invest in this culture and develop and create skills for the local communities so that its members can benefit from the foundation's activities. And um, they make traditional handcrafted goods um, with a beautiful African contemporary design. Uh, those of you that have seen some of the products coming out of Africa and perhaps received uh, some gifts from, from us over the years, you, you can attest to how unique the artworks um, are. Then we also support the Ramahola Primary School, which is an eco school. We teach children how to care for the environment. Uh, we run workshops with teachers and children on the importance of sustainable farming and on the benefits of using natural resources, creating again this entrepreneurship in this farming and rural communities. And then the final pillar that we are focusing on for, for next year will be the economic pillar. Obviously, this is for sustainable profits, for long-term growth and sustainability. And this also speaks to points number 8, 11, and 17 of the Global Sustainability Goals. So it's really creating partnerships with our distributors, with our customers, with the foundations, with the communities, um, and creating sustainable communities and promoting economic growth. So we have a, a little video here just to share with you. This is taken from one of our partners farms um, and yeah, enjoy. Okay, I think maybe let's just take it back. I'm not sure that the sound was coming through there. Um, sorry about that. The joys of live feeds. We're just going to take it back quickly and just check that the sound is coming through. No sound? Sorry, just bear with us for two seconds. Okay, it looks like we're struggling with the sound here, so sorry about that. 
Um, I think moving forward, we will just share this link. Uh, it, it basically just is uh, words from the people on the ground, on the farm, just to give you a little bit of insight as to uh, the communities that we're working with and their feelings um, regarding our, our partnerships. Um, and we will be able to share the link to this video. Uh, we can probably even drop it in the chat on the, on the right hand side of the screen. OK, so moving on then, I will hand over to Timbisile. Um, and she's going to take us through some of the challenges that we're facing before we look at some of the solutions. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and yeah, apologies for the video, but it's actually quite an awesome one. So we'll ensure that when we get the recording or we'll share the video on, on the site so that you can basically hear the story behind um, some of the people that are impacted through this social enterprise farming. Now, looking at the challenges of sustainability, um, when you're trying to be sustainable, it literally means making lifestyle choices to ensure as a farmer, as an enterprise, as a company, that um, whatever choices and daily choices that you make um, are towards being sustainable. That's not always easy, especially when you're dealing with farming. And some of these challenges that um, is faced is basically the future centric aspect about building um, tomorrow's enterprise and environment and not really focusing on today which means a lot of the investment that we're putting in today will not be reaped immediately. It is basically us investing in our tomorrow. And of course, knowing what you don't know, and that is basically farming where each day is a new learning, where you're counting on mother nature to be your teacher. Um, and that's not always very consistent. Um, and so you have to adapt according to the environment and of course, learning from nature and consistent improvements to agro-processing and being patient with the agro-processing instead of trying to choose the easier route or the cheaper route, uh, which tends to be quite harmful, but also just making sure you continue to a consistent agro-processing that is good for nature. And of course, climate change, um, where the impact can be a change between seasons where there isn't consistency. Um, it also means, um, especially in the northern part of South Africa, where drought has become quite prominent as um, it becomes drier and drier. And, you know, looking at replicating, uh, replicating the, oh, sorry, the, the slides just changed there. Um, let's just go back to the challenges quickly. But what we were talking about is also replicating the quality and the product yield, which cannot be the same when it comes to natural ingredients, uh, but because every year, every season is different. Um, and of course, regulatory and governmental support and permits, um, making sure that you're in line with regulation, in line with government, um, and making sure that you have the permits required. All of these are challenges. Um, that you can expect when it comes to um, farming. The solutions, of course, how we proactively do is proactively planning and embracing the unknown, being adaptable, and that sometimes also means having a very good sense of humor and working with great people. Mitigating plants, as my colleagues have said as well, is that we actually have plants on the farm that can handle a lot of these um, climate changes that can handle drought quite strongly because many of these plants don't need a lot of irrigation. It also means um, having a species that's quite robust, as Liesl touched on on the bow bean, for example. This is a succulent, which means basically if you don't have any water, you can literally take the plant out. It turns purple after two weeks. You plant it, give it water again, and it's back to, to being healthy and a live plant. Bioprospecting, um, very important. So utilizing the indigenous traditional knowledge that um, we have in South Africa to help us make sure that we face these challenges in a sustainable way. And of course, partnerships with regulatory bodies. Uh, we have some of these on the right who are basically um, our partners in ensuring that permits and um, governmental support is received and that we're in line with regulation. And of course, with this comes 
um, the fruits of sustainability. As much as we have the challenges and the solutions, we can expect to bear some fruit to what we do. The main important thing about the fruit of sustainability is that we leave the environment in a better state than how it was found. This is very, very important, not only to Cerebral, but to our partner as well, um, in that whatever we do, we make sure that the environment actually benefits from all the, all the processing that we have done. Uh, this includes even planting trees. Uh, for example, quite a number of marula, moringa, and baobab trees have been planted on the farm. This is something that we're not going to bear fruit now. As uh, Liesl has alluded, baobab can take up to about 150 years, but it means basically investing into nature. Improving entire communities through social enterprise, which means your community can actually benefit from the activities that you do. Growing rural livelihoods, uh, the Moringa Outgrower Project, which was actually um, part of the video that we wanted to play for you, which touched on that Outgrower Project, making sure that you create profitability and sustainability into the rural areas. Preserving indigenous and traditional knowledge from Africa, very important to us, in that we utilize the traditional knowledge to ensure that we're sustainable. And of course, creating sustainable macroeconomies uh, within the rural regions. And so you're actually investing back into, into the land and into the people and the community. And of course, planting seeds today for the future to enjoy their fruits tomorrow. Um, again, sustainability is not an immediate um, uh, winning. It takes time, it takes investment, and it's really about investing and ensuring that what you do today actually has big impact for tomorrow. Okay, now we're going to actually look at these African botanicals. Why are they so beneficial and the applications they come under? So the first one being baobab oil. Now baobab oil is a very unique oil and I think that's why it's been so successful in the personal care market. And that is because of its perfect balance between the three fatty acids, which is omega-3, 6, and 9. Um, this would be oleic, palmitic, and linoleic. Um, this helps to maintain healthy skin. And just like the information that Liesl shared with us from the tree, you can expect high nutrition in this oil and that it is rich in vitamins, A, C, D, E, and F. Um, this oil helps to tighten and hydrate um, and also rejuvenate the skin. It is extremely high in antioxidants, making it quite a stable oil and offers free radical damage protection. Very rich in linoleic acid, which aids development of essential fatty acids as well. There's various studies on these oils available, so please reach out to your um, preferred distributor partner to Cerebel for more information on the studies that are done. On the next slide, we actually show the benefit of the baobab oil. On the left, where we actually looked, uh, this is a study that was done independent of Cerebel that shows um, the irritancy or the potential irritancy. And they took baobab oil, deionized de water, and of course, some sodium lauryl sulfate. And the results, as you can see, the darkened um, graph or the darkened column within the graph is the baobab oil, which showed even lower, very low irritancy compared to um, deionized water and sodium lauryl sulfate. On the right is a graph that measures the tool, the transepidermal water loss, where using the baobab had very, very good um, hydrating um, properties and was able to seal in and lock in the moisture in the skin. And of course, these studies are available if, if you would like any copies of that. The second ingredient, the Balbean frutescence, um, one of the favorites at Cerebel because we like to term this as our aloe vera on steroids. Um, this unique extract um, is a water soluble extract. It is used to relieve discomfort immediately, has anti itch and redness reduction effects, and it promotes the skin recovery process. Um, can be used in stretch mark reduction treatments, enables the restoration of the skin barrier, and of course, is extremely good in moisture retention and skin hydration. Um, so just like aloe vera, it offers these benefits, but it also even has better benefits um, and studies that have been done on it. So the next part is what we show 
the activity of the extract on the skin. So the baldine actually stimulates the skin's keratinocytes. Um, and this is where the process of the AQP3 uh, protein, the membrane protein, um, which facilitates in the water and glycerol transport in the epidermis. So here we show the activity of the AQP3, where it is responsible for glycerol transport, water transport within the skin. But what's interesting about AQP3 is this um, unique membrane protein um, helps also with um, wound healing, with skin elasticity and hydration. And this is basically the process that the bulbine activates in the keratinocytes, showing that from a molecular level, it actually works in benefiting the skin, whether for wound healing, skin elast elasticity, and of course, the extract has also been shown to help in the development of collagen, which can then be used for anti-aging type of products. There are more studies that are done on the bulbine frutescence, and of course, this is a unique extract because it comes only within uh, from Southern Africa, um, and it has quite a lot of profiles on it and quite a lot of studies. So these are just some of the snippets or clips uh, from the different studies that are done on the product. Um, it offers antioxidant and anti-inflammatory benefits. Um, and of course, it is registered in the European Union for skin conditioning um, aspects, um, registered in Southern Africa um, as for use in soap and veterinary applications, basically to help increase skin hydration and elasticity. Now to our third ingredient, the Kalahari Desert Melon Seed Oil, which comes from the melon um, fruit. Now this, of course, is quite a unique one and also very sustainable. As Lizo has said, this plant basically grows in drought or very dry conditions, so it doesn't need much irrigation. Very similar to Balbean in that uh, once the seed has been extracted and the oil has been extracted, the waste or the leftover fruits from that can actually be thrown back to the land and the plant regrows again, making it quite um, a perfect candidate for circular economy type of um, farming, very similar to Balbean. Um, this ingredient is unique because of its high linoleic acid um, content in it and the high vitamin E in, in the oil. Um, the next slide does actually touch on this, but it's quite important to highlight on this slide um, that it's non-comedogenic um, and is an excellent moisturizing and skin conditioning oil. Um, very light and can be used um, similar to jojoba oil, but because of its high linoleic acid and vitamin E content, it makes it quite unique. So in the next slide, we actually have a graph that shows the composition compared to other super oils that are on the market. Compared to grapeseed oil, compared to argan oil, compared to sweet almond oil, compared to marula and olive, Kalahari melon has the highest, highest linoleic acid content, um, making it unique and making it quite a stable um, oil. And because of the linoleic acid, there's huge benefits because linoleic acid helps in the free radical scavenging um, potential. It promotes anti-inflammatory um, effects on the skin and reduces irritation quite a bit. Um, can also restrict the formation of eczema. And in terms of vitamin E, the oil has about 2,800 milligrams of vitamin E per kilogram, which is extremely high compared to these super oils as well. And of course, there was a topical uh, clinical study or assessment done on the oil, just similar to uh, the barbab oil that we've done. Um, and here it, on the graph on the right is basically as well a tool graph, which shows that the Kalahari melon um, is just as good as your Vaseline or liquid paraffin in terms of retaining moisture in the skin. And so the study concludes that the high linoleic acid content particularly may be responsible for the positive effects on the skin. And the oil has been confirmed as non-irritant and showed efficacy in reduction of skin dryness and moisture retention by preventing the transepidermal water loss on the skin.
The next ingredient that we look at, which has been popular in the market for some time now, would be the marula oil. Now, the marula oil is very popular because of its high oleic acid content, um, its high antioxidant ability, which helps with the anti-aging, and good hydration because of that oleic acid um, and anti-inflammatory properties. Of course, it's high in vitamin C and vitamin E as well. Also quite a lot of studies that are found and have been done on marula oil, um, which shows the benefits, but the biggest highlight when it comes to this oil is intense hydration. The next slide shows um, a graph that highlights this as well in terms of the transepidermal water loss or moisture retention. The major fatty acid constituent is oleic acid, which is absorbed quite quickly into the skin. And of course, marula oil affects the moisture level of the skin by causing some hydration. And of course, it's non-irritant to the skin as well. Now we come to the Moringa oil, which comes from what is deemed the miracle or the wonder tree because of its high nutritional value. Now the Moringa oil is also quite a unique oil, um, very rich in antioxidant and very, very stable oil. Um, it has high vitamin A, C and E, very good healing and anti-inflammatory benefits as well. It helps to build collagen um, and it repairs damaged skin cells. The high slip of the oil with low spread spreadability makes it an ideal oil to use in high pigmented formulations such as lipstick. And furthermore, um, all Moringa oil has very high behemic acid in it, and that makes it an ideal oil for hair care application due to excellent hair conditioning and moisturizing properties and smoothing properties of the behemic acid. On the next slide, there was a clinical study and assessment that was done on the oil, which compared it to jojoba oil, macadamia, marula, almond oil, wheat germ oil, and even some sunflower, um, hybrid uh, safflower, sunflower oil. And what was found with the Moringa oil is that out of all these super oils, such as jojoba and marula, it has the highest oxidative stability compared to these oils. This makes it extremely stable, and that is due to the high <coughs> antioxidant properties of the oil, um, which means using this oil, there will be reduction in the need for a BHT to prevent um, any rancidity. Um, so it's a very, very stable um, oil um, that can be used for both hair care and for skin care. Okay, and that is basically it in terms of our oils. Uh, Lisa will speak to the formulation that use these ingredients. Okay, so next we'll just give you a few ideas of products that you can actually make using these oils. Um, so there's a there's quite a few that we've done, and we've 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 focused on the the self care and the home spa. So if you look at like something like a caring bath oil. Um, we use the, the, the melon seed oil and the moringa oil, um, especially because the Kalahari melon seed oil is quite light on the skin, so it won't give you that oily effect. Um, and then you have the nourishment from the moringa oil. And what you can, of course, also do is in our previous webinar, we've spoken about the oil softwares. So you can also put in an oil softwear in this bath oil with maybe a, a water um, water soluble ingredient. As you can see, uh, we only add about 2%, 4% total of the oils, and it actually does not affect um, the color of the, of the product that much. Um, it still stays quite clear, um, even though the oils has got slight yellow tinge to it. Then the next formulation um, is more, it's more of a tissue oil that you would apply directly to the skin, and we call it like an all-purpose body tissue oil. Um, here we've used some of the baobab oil, again the Kalahari melon because of the, the light touch and the baobab to give you that nourishment. And what we've actually also done is we've used the oil software which we encapsulated the bulbine which is water soluble. So you will have the soothing effect of the bulbine and all the other properties that the bulbine will bring to the skin. The next formulation is a face serum. Um, as you can see, it's a very nice glossy serum you can use on your face. 
Uh, here we definitely went with the Balbean because of the Balbean having the nice moisturizing effect on the skin. Um, and then a combination of the Kalahari melon seed, which is which is good for acne, but because it's more of an all-purpose um, face serum, we've also added some of the Surinap Marula oil um, so that you can have the nourishment and the moisturization to the skin. Um, a very high content of vitamin E because the Kalahari melon seed oil already contains some vitamin E, which means that you can only add a small bit of 0.5% of the vitamin E to give you the antioxidant effect on your skin. Then we've also made a soothing gel, which will be very, um, very good for your skin, especially maybe after a, a long day in the sun. So there you have the Balbean extract, which will help with the soothing. You can also add some of our other ingredients, like we said, the scent swear to give you, to, to give you that nice smell to it. Um, and then also the butter swears to give you the nourishment. So after the soothing, you've got the Balbean who will soothe the skin and get rid of the redness of the skin. And then adding the mango butter swears to give you the moisturization and the nice skin feel um, on the skin. And then we will mostly focus on skin applications and face applications. You can also make something like a deep conditioning hair mask, um, which will apply to, the, to your hair. Um, it has got the, the nice rice bran wax, which is also quite sustainable and all part of the circular economy as the wax inside the, the hair mask. Then as um, Tembi told you, the Moringa and the Baobab oil are both very good oils for your hair. Um, and we've added both of them, only need about 4% in the formulation. And again, having that butter swear to give you the nourishment of the hair. Um, so as you can see, all of these oils and extracts can be quite versatile, versatile used in um, hair and skin applications and face applications. Uh, we like to experiment a lot, so please, if you've got any questions or any ideas, please let us know. The, the development lab is always keen to prepare a prototype or two. And then just to also say thank you for today for attending um, and like listening in and listening to all of us talk about all the interesting things at Cerebral. Uh, we will be talking to you again on our next webinar where we will look at clean and natural exfoliating spheres, which is quite a buzzword these days, um, where we look more like at the, the microplastics and the anti-microplastics and what Cerebral can offer you instead of microplastics. So thank you again for your attention. And if there's any um, if there's any questions, now will be the time. Just pop it in the meeting chat, and we will try and answer all of your questions. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to open up the Q and A session. Um, Please, if you've got any questions, just pop them in the right hand side of the screen and we will do our best to answer them for you. Okay, the questions are coming through. We're just uh, having a look at them and we'll be answering them shortly. Okay, the first question somebody has asked is, do we offer conventional and organic grades of the, the oils and extracts? And the answer is yes, we do. Uh, we can offer both organic certified or conventional grades. Okay, there's a question that's come through regarding a prototype or sample kits. Uh, yes, we do have these available, so it's not a problem. Just be in touch with your distributor um, and they can send a request through and we can happily send prototypes of sample formulations.
Okay, so we have a question on whether our ingredients can be used in a hot process. The answer is yes for all the oils because all the oils have high oxidative stability. The only ingredient that doesn't tolerate high temperature is our Balbean extract as that has a limit of 40 degrees Celsius. So we always recommend adding the Balbean at the end of the process um, as you introduce possibly your fragrance uh, because it is not as heat stable. It uh, is stable up until 40 degrees Celsius. Okay, just a question regarding this actual webinar. Yes, there will be a link shared on the website. We will also send the link out to the distributors um, and they can share that with the customers. And there will be a uh, PDF version available as well. Okay, we have a question regarding the Balbean um, and toxicity. Liesl? Oh, I can answer it. <laughs> okay, so yes, there has been clinical studies that are done on the Balbean, on the safety of using Balbean. Um, it's non carcinogenic, it's non irritant, um, and it has been tested to be safe either on baby or sensitive skin um, or any type of skin. There's another question that's come through on how Balbean compares to aloe vera. Uh, we are currently busy with a study, a clinical study, and we're quite excited um, at what the preliminary results are showing. So we will be sharing that um, in the near future. Okay, there's a question regarding sharing of the presentation um, within your networks. Uh, this presentation, this webinar is being currently attended by distributors and customers, as well as our other partners um, in, the, in terms of the producers and the, some of our um, university uh, partners. So yes, with pleasure, you are more than welcome to share the presentation. They will be, anyway be shared on social media platforms like LinkedIn. Um, and on our website platform, so there is no problem sharing these, these, uh, this information. Please go ahead. <laughs> we would be very happy for you to share it. Okay, there's another question that's come through regarding um, our sourcing on our partnerships with the farm. Is it specific to South Africa or do we work through traders? Oh yes, um, so the good thing about working through Cerebal is that we do not work with traders. Um, all our ingredients are sourced from the southern part of Africa, so you can always um, be happy or rely on knowing that the origin remains the same. Um, it does not change, we work only through um, one of our partners.
So there was a, a question about the, the percentage um, of, of the oil. Um, so the oil inside the seed is quite low. You, you only about 3% to 5% oil inside the seed. However, the process that we're using or that our grower is using, um, the extraction process is quite efficient. So they extract quite a lot of that 3%. I would say about 99% of the 3% is extracted. Okay, um, I think for now we're going to close off the session. We've just run about five minutes over the hour. Please, if, there, if you have any further questions, don't hesitate to ask. You're welcome to contact your distributor in your region or pop us a mail, pop us a, a message um, on, on LinkedIn. Follow, please follow our page on LinkedIn. We tend, we're using that platform quite a lot to share uh, the current news and the projects and, and what's happening at Cerebal. Um, so please follow that. And yeah, we just would like to say thank you very much again for joining us. Um, it's been our pleasure to, to present this, this uh, section on our oils. Again, if you would like to have a look at the first webinar, which we focused on moisturization and hydration on our waxes portfolio, this, this presentation was focused on our botanical uh, range, obviously for, that speaks to the sustainability trend. And as Liesl mentioned, our next webinar, which will be coming up at the end of November, we'll be speaking to the microplastics um, and the, the new results and products that we have for that. So yes, please feel free to contact us and we wish you a wonderful day further. And thank you again for joining us. Bye.